Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of Source and Company. I am your host, Source, of course. As always, you can follow me on Instagram and or Twitter, SMA Source on both of those. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel and the Spotify, which are under Source and Company. And you can uh, follow the Source and Company Instagram, which is Source and CO Podcast underscore R V. A. All right. Yeah. Let's get into it. All right. So I'm going to tell y'all right now, this is going to be the most unprofessional uh, conversation episode, probably, because <laughs> I've been laughing the whole time. I feel so uncomfortable having this conversation, but I don't know why. It's just weird. Anyway, today's company, episode 52, is going to be the last one of year one for Source and Company. Uh, thank y'all for watching, subscribing, all that good stuff. And I figured I might as well get this guy in here to end off year one. So he is the co-founder of the Spot Recording Studio in Richmond, Virginia. If you did any type of music over the past 20 plus years, then I guarantee you went to the spot at some point in time in your uh, travels. So co-founder there, his engineer, did all the, all, the, all the tough stuff, all the hard work. He is also producer known as Dox One, done work with uh, a number of artists from Wordsworth, who was episode 50's uh, company, or source and company, Ill Bill, The Rangers, Pumpkinhead, Jojo Pellegrino, who am I missing, Boogeyman, so many people, so many people. And we about to find out some, some other names that I didn't even know about in a second. Currently, he is a web designer at Virginia Commonwealth University. His name, Todd Easter. What up, man? What's going on? <laughs> I'm tripping already, man. This is, oh, yeah, this be interesting. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be interesting, but we're going to have a good time. So let's just, I said VCU, but let's just throw this out here right now. We're in the midst of March Madness, and VCU ended up having to go home before playing their first game about a week ago uh, due to COVID. Crazy, right? No, very, very crazy. And I remember looking, um, just checking to see what was going on. Like, what time was the game? I told my son we were going to stay up to watch the game. I was going to let him stay up that night. And, you know, like an hour before to figure out exactly what time the game started, what channel, and just to see the news was crazy. Especially just to know that on campus, things aren't actually that bad right now. So, you know, to see that, was it, I think it was three positive cases, like right before the game. And he had to, yeah, it was, it was just crazy. Yeah, man, unexpected. Only squad to have to take that L that way. And uh, that's tough, man. That's tough. And this is the, actually we're at the 10 year anniversary of VCU making that run to the Final Four, bro. I was just talking about it yesterday about how the city was on fire and uh, I oh, did crazy. pieces from, from going, them going to the Final Four. It was crazy. Cars burning, trash cans, you know, stuff on fire downtown. The streets were packed. It was, it was wild. It was a fun time, though. I remember trying to go to Kickback Jacks to watch the game and couldn't even get a seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we got to take advantage of those times when we have them because they're few and far between for the city since we don't have any professional teams here, for real, for real. So Exactly. But it is what it is. Docs won. This is, I'm not even going to call you Todd. I don't, do I call you Todd? What do I call you? I don't know, honestly. I mean, I would say Todd. I'm maybe Todd. I don't know, man. But anyway, Todd, Easter, Docs, whatever the case may be. Let's just, let's talk about, let's take it all the way back real quick. Let's go back okay. to childhood. So you are the youngest. Yes, okay. youngest, two older sisters. Three, yeah, okay. Youngest of three. And you're the only boy. Huh. Only boy. How'd that go? Uh, it was weird. I basically grew up as an only child because both of my sisters are so much older than me that by the time I was three, four, both of them had um, moved out of the house. Um, I think both of them were actually married by the time I was like, say, five years old. And so, yeah, I pretty much grew up as an only child, you know, had to run in the house and I was the only boy, so I was spoiled, you know, pretty much got every opportunity that they didn't get. That kind of stuff. No hand-me-downs. It was perfect. You definitely had no hand-me-downs. There was nothing to hand down. 
the the funniest thing is the only hand me down I got that I remember is um one of my sisters had gotten a bomber jacket and the the style that she wanted they could only find it in the boys section mm. so right at the time of the bombers coming in style I was given this jacket that was like my size at that point so a lot of people thought I had the run DMC jacket when I was in school and I'm thinking to myself like nah this is like 15 years old from Sears, but we're going to rock with it like that. Like, yeah, we went up to New York to get this joint and brought it down here. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, the whole thing. You know, I had the style on y'all. I had the style. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hilarious. Hilarious. But when did, when did the love of music come into play? Uh, I, I can't think of anything specifically. And I, I really credit that to my sisters being older because I didn't, I think back now when I realized I paid attention to hip hop more than I thought I was going into something specifically at the time. I do remember in kindergarten, um, we had a dance and they let everybody bring two records. Like if you have a song you want to bring, um, you know, you could bring in up to, I think it was like three records. So I brought in two and I brought, um, I can't remember. I know one of them was Spoon and G, Spoon and Rap. And the other one was a Sugar Hill record. Um, Oh, uh, it was um, Apache. That's what it was. So those are the two records I bought. And it's like, now I think about it, it's like, I wasn't necessarily bringing rap records. These were just songs at, at the house that I liked because my sisters have been collecting all of that music. So I was listening to like all of their old music that they had left at home. And that was just what I gravitated to. So it was very, very early on. Yeah, that was early on. You're talking about Apache, there you go. I, I didn't have that luxury, unfortunately. Well, I don't know, I, I say unfortunately, but older siblings, same, but I'm just thinking about this, the style of music, you know, was no rapping, no <laughs> secular music in my house, boy. It was all gospel, it was the gospel oh. boards for probably till I was 12, something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, that was a whole different world. A different world. <laughs> yeah, I remember the first the first albums that I had for myself were I got them both the same day. It was the first Fat Boys album and the the Run DMC King of Rock album. I got both of those the same day. I think I was like seven years old. I feel like an idiot because I started this show with that intro. I didn't even say it. so. When I was a rapper, this was my producer. We were a group, <laughs> folks. But I left that part out. Like I'm like, I, it, it didn't even occur to me. You didn't say it either. Yeah, it's crazy. So yeah, we did the grown folks thing for for a few years for seven, yeah. seven eight years, six. Yeah, years. It's, it's and it's easy to get that mixed up because we started doing songs that ended up morphing into grown folks songs, but they weren't intended that way when we started. Yeah. And the whole thing just kind of happened organically. It was just like the nature of the music we were making lent itself to creating the group. So, yeah. 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 So we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I do want to mention that you you had the opportunity to to go to college out of state. You headed up to, to Delaware. Yes. How and how and why did that happen? All right. So two answers. One. At the time, except for Virginia Tech, all right, actually three things. The first thing was I really wanted to be on my own. I wanted that sense of my parents just can't drive up here in a couple hours and be right here. So I wanted to go somewhere at least three hours away. So Delaware take that box. Two, um, at the time, the only um like really like nationally thought of program, VCU didn't have engineering at the time, and I was an electrical engineering major. So it was like either go to tech or, you know, you know, maybe Hampton would have been like my next other choice. And I felt like those were too close that they could just pop up to. So it was like, all right, I need to think elsewhere. Um, and three, I had the fleeting thought of hoop dreams. So it was kind of like, if I go to Delaware, their division one AA, maybe I could get on got up there and realized very quickly that won't go happen, but I was already there at that point, so it's too late. Man, Blue Hands, right? Blue Hands, yep. Yeah, New Newark, Delaware. Don't say Newark. 
Yeah, actually, you know, uh, I actually stayed in, in New York. It's hood and a mug. It's, it's very country, very rural, but the gang culture is very thick in Delaware. It's crazy. Bro, I went up there, my, my aunt passed uh, over a year ago, and I went up there for the funeral. And I was like, bro, where? And I did this is not what I was looking for. This is not what I expected to be in. But uh, it is what it is, yeah. Oh, anyway, so I mentioned that you are a producer, obviously, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. But you, before we started this, you mentioned some things that threw me because I've never heard this before. I had no idea. So I, I named off some, some notable people that you had done work with that actually came out but you were like and i asked you about uh camp low i asked you about camp low and you said that there was a song but you never heard it yes it, and it and it we guess it never came out no it definitely never came out yeah but you ran off some other names and and had me like hold on bro you did work with with who just let, tell me because i need to understand what's going on what did i miss all right so this was probably a lot of these records were actually before during yeah probably before and during the grown folks thing um like before the grown folks thing the last one i mentioned as you didn't know about was the dmx record that i did um and before i go into this i say i did because supposedly i was told from whoever did the song or their representatives that yes the song was done or i was done by whoever assisted me in getting the track to the artist but I actually never heard the song. So usually when I talk to people about those, I'll never say I did it, but th these are the ones that supposedly I did do. But um, I did a record with DMX. Um, at the time, I had a manager, Dave Brooks. That's my man. Um, you know what I'm saying? And we went to a music conference. I want to say it was Impact in Florida. I feel like that's what it was. The last year of Impact, it was in Orlando, Florida. And we flew out, actually it wasn't impact, but it was a situation where I flew out a day or two days before he did coming back to, um, to VA. And while he was still there, he ended up hooking up with um, one of the a and from Bloodline Records right around the time that DMX had um, started his own label that was an imprint with Def Jam. And the conversation was that he was, they were getting together tracks for, I believe it was the Grand Royal album. And long story short, a song was done. When Dave asked me how much did I want for the song, I said, I didn't care, give him the beat. And he refused to give him the beat because he said that, which makes perfect sense. I, you know, I, ain't, I ain't gonna say it's like I'm upset. It makes sense to me. If you give it to, give it to somebody for free, then it has no value. They ain't gonna worry about it. We gotta charge them something they started going back and forth on the money. And that also happened at the same time when DMX was going through some issues. So it's just one of those things where, because things didn't probably go smoothly, that song got pushed to the side. So I'm not gonna blame him and say like, oh, it was his fault, he was looking for too much money. Like there were a lot of moving parts at play for that one particular song that I'm pretty sure that it was, it was a number of things that probably prevented that from going down. You mentioned Dave. Shout out to Dave. I love Dave. Oh, yeah. Dave, Dave, Dave's a funny dude. You, but some, when you started talking, it reminded me of, I think, I think it was Dave. I, I remember you telling me a story of Dave, a CD. <laughs> was, it, was it Puffy? It was, yes, it was Puffy. So he, um, <laughs> all right. Me and Dave go back years. Um, from when I first met him back in the days when he um, he and Hilo started Noisemaker Records and that whole thing. But this is from his Noisemaker days. And he had went down to something in Miami. It was something big going on in Miami and everybody was down there. Um, it's a couple of days stories. If you, ever, if you ever decide to interview him, you got to ask him about when he got in the fight with Busta Rhymes because I think this all happened that same weekend. Yeah. But, um, he said that um, a whole bunch, he heard, a, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna butcher this story, but he heard a whole bunch of people yelling um, that Diddy was somewhere in the vicinity. They were all outdoors. And he finally saw Diddy and he happened to have a high-low package with him. So he happened to see him, but Diddy was on his way to a car. He was stepped in the car, it was a convertible. 
So he said he got close enough where he could just hum the package and it landed in his back seat. So he thought, you know, it was a win because it landed as Diddy was driving off. And he said he saw Diddy get to the stop sign at the end of the street, look back in the back seat of the car, find a package, chucked it out, and then turned and drove off. So, yeah. That is hilarious. Yeah. It's hilarious. I got a holiday because I need to I need to hear the uh the official story of that joke. Yeah, yeah. That is I, I know I know I butchered it, but yeah, that's the that's the gist of the story. So you mentioned Buster Rhymes a minute ago, and you mentioned Buster Rhymes and the people with the with the supposed uh tracks. Uh, yes, all right. This one is a little bit more roundabout. Um I'm not even gonna say names, but there was a contact I had here in Richmond when we first opened up the studio. It was another studio owner that we had met and we had got come cool with and done some collaboration work back and forth. I did some production for their art for um his artists. Um it's hard not to leave out names. I just don't want to get specific. Right. Um but he got into some other businesses with um or in and around music outside of like management and production. And he was doing a lot of trips regularly back and forth to New York. And this was right around the time that the mixtape culture had gotten big. So he had made a lot of connections in the mixtape game and had started to actually meet and network with artists and A&Rs and major labels. So he comes to me one day, he needed a favor um, at the studio and I did the favor for him. And he says, matter of fact, um, I needed this favor because I'm on my way to New York. I'm leaving this afternoon. If you got any beats, I could take them up there for you. So I made a beat CD like real quick. It only had like four joints on it and I gave it to him. And I don't know all the details because I, I heard bits and pieces after that time, but it turns out that the last time I saw him was the last time he came back to Virginia, that he went to New York and stayed there. Um, now fast forward about a year and a half and um, through just through the studio, we had, at times we had a lot of people come that had label connections, a lot of people that had artist connections that would just randomly come through and different things like that. Had a guy in there that um, was a um, promo guy for a few independent labels. Right. And I played him some beats and he was like, yo, I heard this before. This is a Busta Rhymes record. And I said, no, this is a beat I made about two years ago. Like, I haven't even really sent this out. And he's like, no, I guarantee you, I heard this. This is a Busta Rhymes record. It never came out, but Busta himself played this song for me. I heard this before. And it just and it just happened to be one of the tracks. So I reached out to somebody who had a connection to the guy who moved to New York that was still here. And he's like, and he basically clowned me. He said, you gave him beats? You really gave him, like, you know, one of those sorts of things. So it's like, his reaction lent itself to this probably wasn't the same sample that this dude probably did sell my track. And the only reason why I actually really, really believe it is because there's another record that came out. Um, the guys that started FUBU had created an independent label. I can't think of the name of the label, but they had an act called Fifth Platoon. And they had a single that came out. And one of my beats that was on that CD that I gave that dude ended up being one of the B-side to their single that didn't really do nothing. So it's one of those things where I, I kind of believe that this was a Busta Rhymes record that I never heard that I ghost produced, I guess. I believe it. And now that you tell the whole story, I remember the story. I remember the, uh, yeah. the counting you part and giving that guy the, uh, <laughs> the beat CD. Yes, I had forgotten all about that joint. I didn't remember the Busta Rhymes part, but, and you also yeah. Common. I got to remember Common because you know Common is one of my favorite rappers of all time. So, sure, is there a story? Um, that was real simple. Shout out to DJ Rerock. Um, Rerock had um, asked me for some beats. He had another um, producer that he was working with, Shuko, that was doing a ton of stuff. Shuko's from Europe, um, but he was getting a lot of placements at the time. So, a lot of doors were opening up for Rerock. And he was like, yo, if you hit me off with some beats, when somebody's asking for stuff from Shuko, I can send your stuff and you know try to get it through. So with that through Rerock, I had a Joe Budden record and a Common record. Um, according to Rerock, I did those beats, but he wasn't one hundred percent sure if I did them or Shuko did them. But he said he was like he said I'm he's like I'm pretty sure you did them. But 
same thing. Never heard the song, so I was like, man, nah, who knows? Hey, man, it's on some what could have been type stuff. That's oh, yeah. Now, the what could have been that should, that I never heard, but I do believe is true, is the um, the um, Freeway Beanie Siegel record that never came out. But that was through Takedown, and that's a whole nother story if you ever want to go, in, go into that one. I don't think you, we want to go into the Takedown, <laughs> takedown records. Uh, yeah, we're going to let that one be for, for today. For today, maybe another time we get into that, John. Oh, man. So, yeah, so... But even outside of that, I mean, you've done a lot of work. And you mentioned you mentioned people have come through the spot regularly that have mm-hmm. connections out of town, blah, blah, blah. I mean, y'all, I just remember plaques, you know, being on the wall. And and even in passing, you'd be like, so yeah, blah, 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 I was here uh, the other night. And blah, blah. I'm like, hold on, bro. <laughs> what are you talking about? Or oh, you was just passing through town and needed a studio. I, give me something. Uh, let me see. Let me go back. Um, I recorded Graf. Graf was fun. Graf is a funny dude. Like, really, really funny dude. Good people. All right, y'all. So, we're back. We had some technical difficulties midstream, uh, but we are in a better place now, so we should be good to go. Docs, Todd, Mr. Easter, whatever your name is. <laughs> we're explaining um talking about people that that had been to the studio to the spot recording studio that you had worked with uh, as far as engineering them and sessions and you mentioned graph mm. which you said graph was funny and then you start talking about swizz yeah really really funny dude um swizz was supposed to come to the studio um i had met um one of the cool things about rough riders is that they had um took the motorcycle club and they had created different motorcycle clubs in different areas, but those clubs were also hubs for promotions for their records. So I gotten really, really cool with the, um, the president of the Petersburg chapter. So she kept telling me, she was like, you know, you know, you real cool, you were cool. I'm going to talk to my people about you, see what we could do. She gave me a call one day and said, yo, Swiss is in town. I want you to meet him. Whatever. But, you know, it's an, it's an invitation. I'm gonna go ahead and accept. Um, so I went out there and met with Swiss. Really, really, really cool dude. Um, I got fully expected him to have an attitude. Like he had plaques and songs all over the radio. Like you just knew he was gonna be arrogant. Really, really humble guy. Um, was supposed to come into the studio, but last minute he got a call um, to do a show in Norfolk that night. This was back yeah. when he was promoting his first um, single. So he had a, um, a show to do in Norfolk, so he had to leave town ASAP. Um, probably the, um, I go with the biggest one, was definitely recording Rick Ross. Um, and that was a crazy one because we got a call from Atlantic Records. I was in the studio. We got a call um, saying that Trick Daddy was in town and that he needed somewhere to do some last minute vocals on a record. So we're like, all right, cool. Try to get, get an engineer schedule. Nobody could do it. So I ended up having to stay there all day to record, to record that night. So everybody comes into the studio and I'm looking around because I'm expecting Trick Daddy. And I see this one light skinned dude with dreads. And I'm like, he looks familiar, but out of all these people that just came in here, I, I don't see Trick Daddy at all. So I keep walking around, walking around, you know, talking to people because, you know, it was all the artists in his camp. It was nobody there from Atlantic that I could really talk to. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. So I leave and I finally go back into the control room and Rick Ross is just sitting there on the couch. And this was right at the time of hustling. Like hustling was probably the biggest record in the country at this point. So I'm thinking to myself, like, why is Atlanta calling? Because he's obviously a Def Jam artist. And then why is Rick Ross here at the studio? So come to find out that it was in to do a single with him and Trick Daddy. Um, is oh, I can't think of the name of the song. I still have a copy of Rick Ross's verse that didn't make the album because this all happened right at the time that they started beefing. So Trick Daddy didn't want to put the verse on this album. But um, I just know it was a Kane Beach track. Oh, I can't think of the song, but that was probably the biggest one. But the one that I remember the most was a guy showed up, he said he was new to town and he um, was looking for a studio to do some quick work out of. So I come in, real humble, nice guy. I should give him a tour around and stuff like that. And I just knew his name. Um, was Dave. So when we left, 
um, something, somehow we got on a topic of like what name these produce on that. He said, Super Dave West. And I go to him, I said, like, that's an interesting name. You know, there's a producer for De La Soul, there's some stuff for Michelle and Deggio Cello that has the exact same name. He's like, yeah, that's me. So I'm asking him, like, wait a minute, like, I gave you the tour, like, you here locally, like, what are you doing here? And he just gave me the whole thing about um, how most people from New York have family down south. It's always everybody's dream. When you get a little bit of money, you'll go get a bigger house with more land in Virginia, North Carolina, da, da, da. So he wanted to raise his kids in a better area. So he moved here to Richmond. He eventually moved to Atlanta, but he was coming in and out of the studio for like a good year. Um, he helped me make some connections, try to get some stuff, some placements for me. You know, like really, really, really good dude. So you'd be surprised at who comes through Richmond on a regular basis and, and does stuff. Um, you know, just, you know, yeah, you'd be surprised at who comes through. <laughs> that's dope, though. I remember the, the uh, Super Dave West time. I was like, yo, that's that's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Especially oh, it, was, it was real crazy for me, especially, you know, this is right around the time. I want to say right around the time that De La Soul's The Grind Day came out. And Dave West had some of my favorite beats at, at like at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So for him to just roll up in the studio nonchalant like just dolo super humble you know letting me he he didn't been in million dollar studios and you know the spot was a spot you know it is it was you know where a lot of richmond records got life but you know it's not like the hit factory or you know all these you know all these other places that he's worked out of that he's been to and it's like you know real humble really really nice guy you know, just, yeah, it, just great guy all the way around. And I, I got a ton of stories that I, I, I told him I would never repeat. So, yeah. First of all, you ain't gonna be disrespecting the spot like that. I understand you being humble and I understand what you're saying. It's not the hit factory and all that, but to Richmond uh, for a good- No, 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 no. It was the hit factory. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no disrespect. It's more comparative than, you know, like we, we have our plaques and, you know, the, the people that have come through the spot is like, just to think back about just the history of just that location outside of me is, it's crazy. The amount of work, the amount of artists, the amount of super, like future superstars that's come through there is like, no, I can't, I can't take anything away from it at all. Like, you know, even with me not being in there as much anymore, like those guys hold it down. They all do great work. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, you know, I, it was more just in relation to the projects that he's worked on, like that sort of thing. Like, no, no, no disrespect at all. Like, yeah, like I still work you're, out of the spot. Your co-founder of the spot, I mean, you couldn't really. Yeah, no. Uh, anyway. No. Oh, man. So out of all those great, uh, you, you mentioned a bunch of greats and great projects. I'm going to mention it and I'm we going to talk about it real quick because we're here. So, hey. That grown folks child's play album was that was that was one of those projects that was pretty dope and uh i'm not gonna say a lot of people say it's one of the, one of the better albums that, that's uh come out of this area but so i've heard that a few times it was one of the better albums to come out of this area that was back in 2006 i think we ended up that we were recording that joint from let's see love music was actually done in 2000 it was love music. Love music was done at the end of two thousand two slash two thousand three. Okay, in two thousand three. That feels about right. And the album and that song never came out till two thousand six. But it was a pretty dope project. Like you gotta say. <laughs> oh no 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 no! I, yeah, I still go. But there's there's songs, you know, especially now that everything is streaming. Now there's songs that are on on the internet that I'll still go back and, and listen to like every once in a while. Like I gotta hear, I got my seal copy. I'm never opening that one. So, you know, thank goodness for screaming, for streaming. Yeah, I do too. And I'm holding on to that joint as, as if it's gonna be worth a million dollars, but it's worth a million to me. It's it's worth it to me, yeah. It was a dope project. And we also did It Is What It Is, which was the mixtape like two years before, uh, maybe a year before the uh, Child's Play album actually came out. Mm -hmm. Oh man. So, so many, so many directions we can go. Let's, since we're talking about the album, not really, but Teresa Cook is a, a singer songwriter who actually was on the album back in the day. And she's still, still doing a lot of work today. Um, 
And I always see her on, on IG. I need to reach out to her for real and uh, see if I can holler at her, see, see if she want to jump on with the sauce and uh, her own episode. But what do you remember about, I say remember, like you don't see her. You may still see her. I don't know. But what do you I mean, remember? I saw, yeah, I, I saw like, I, mean, I think a year ago. Um, yeah. 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 But before we could act, when we could actually see each other in, in, in person. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. What do you remember about even just working on the album in between? I mean, it was Teresa, but yeah, Sean Dubois, Sean Chappelle. Uh, and I'm just naming people that actually came to the studio because the album, I mean, the album had like Darian Brockington, Sky Zoo, uh, you know, Phil Dag. Yeah, yeah, it had. Billy Wynn. A nice little, a nice little uh, list of guests on that joint. But what do you remember about the recording of uh, the ladies, we'll say the ladies from, from the album? And it's funny you brought up Sean Chappelle because that's the one thing I always think about is I actually wasn't there for that session when Sean Chappelle came. It in. was Matt. Mm -hmm. I remember because yeah. Sean said, Sean said to me, wait, Sean, I'm still mad about this. I just want you to know it hurt my feelings. I have feelings too. People don't think I have feelings sometimes, man. I have feelings. Listen, Matt plays a song for us. He's like, yeah, I wrote this joint, blah, blah, blah. Check it out. It's me, Sean, and one other person and, and Matt. He plays a song. It's dope. It's dope. Like, yeah, that joint's nice. That's a nice song. And he was like, yo, I was thinking about, you know, because it, it kind of repeats itself. It's like four bars, same four bars over and over, but it was still dope. And he was like, I was thinking, should I uh should I, you know, do a bridge somewhere, you know, in there? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you know, I was gonna say that, but I mean, it was, it was a dope joint, but yeah, a bridge would bring, would break the monotony. Sean says, no, cause you can K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. And she said it and she looked at me and I was like, Sean, how are you gonna talk to me like that? I know you really mean it, but it hurt my feelings. I tell her that every time I, I see her, it, it hurt me. But anyway, <laughs> you were there for the Sean Chappelle one, correct? Yeah, I, I, it's one of the things I think of because we've crossed paths on like so many different projects and so many different situations, but I've never actually met her. So it's like for what? her, yeah, I've never actually met Sean Chappelle. So for her to be on the album is one of the things I always think about, like she's on my album and I still never met actually physically, I might have said hi to her one time and that, and that would be the extent of any kind of connection that, that she or I have. Wow, really? That's kind of crazy. Between, between all of the stuff, you know, the, the little bit of interaction I had with like the super friends, between all the stuff with Clef and with um, EMG, Grown Folks album. Yeah, all of the many of ways that we could have crossed paths and yeah, not once. Wow, that's crazy. That's crazy. I don't even know what to say to that because I'm, I'm just thinking back to the last time I actually talked, I, last time I actually talked to her in person, I think might have been after Clef Pass when they had the, the benefit, not, well, I guess it was a benefit, concert joint. Uh, I guess it was a few, a few months after afterwards and they performed, her, her and the ladies performed and a bunch of people performed. But I remember talking to her at the end and we, you and I were together pretty much the whole night. So I was yeah, okay. Here because it was at the very end, and actually went up to her, talked to her, gave her a hug, and I don't know, I don't know. But if I had known that, I definitely would have been like, "Yo, this is <laughs> this is uh, you might have might have heard of." Yeah, no. Nah. Like I said, the many, as many a times as, and I've seen Sean perform so many times, like just great, great, great artist, but. Yeah, just never had the opportunity to actually interact. Yeah, that's hilarious and and ridiculous at the same time. <laughs> uh, like I did, I mentioned Teresa because Teresa actually sung on uh, "Goodbye." Actually, yeah, "Goodbye." Which oh man, that's that's yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tough memories, tough memories. But well, I mean, that's what that that's the album was you know kind of grown off of you know. So yeah. Yeah, true, true. Um, what do you remember about Teresa? Because you worked with Teresa before. I mean, y'all were friends before I ever even met her. Oh yeah. Um just big, strong, just beautiful voice. Um 
and, and really, really good people. I, I last saw our flag on the moon, um, the um, event that um, AGM does every year. Well, they did do before, you know, every year. Um, it's, it's a lot of emotions wrapped up in that song to, to, to really go into depth. But, um, you know, it was, it was, I wanted somebody who I felt like could connect for that, for that particular record. I needed somebody who I knew had emotion in their voice to really kind of connect and do, and do that song justice and bring, bring the, the concept to light. I don't know how, how deep you want to go into it on that one. So. No, you know, I don't know how deep you were going to it. We can, we can let it be. We can save it for another time. Because one day, like I said, we're going to get together and just... Do a retrospective. Yes, retrospective from, from the album. We can do the mixtape and the album together. Boom, boom. And just run through the tracks and uh, how they came out. The mixtape will be fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be dope. That's going to be dope. Um, so currently, you're, you're a web designer. Yes. I remember... I mean, you were always technically sound obviously you know you're an engineer music engineer so you dealing with board and technical stuff is kind of your forte but you became a web designer by mistake if i remember correctly or by by uh need not by want yeah it really just came out of um shout out to ben carey um he and I did an event together in 2001 called True Form. Um, it was kind of like a five elements um, show, showcase, outdoor festival in Shaco Bottom that had its own problems. But we kind of did everything as low budget as possible. So he did the flyers. Um, I asked, you know, I first saw the flyers, I like, these are dope. How'd you do them? He gave me a copy of Photoshop. So from there, I just started playing around because I've always done art. I've always like drawn and just done just different creative um, endeavors. So started playing around with that. And that was at the time that we had opened up the studio, looking at doing, you know, flyers for the studio, different things. So started doing flyers, needed a website, built a website, you know, using Photoshop. And as I realized different marketing needs that we needed as far as the studio goes, started teaching those to myself so we didn't have to spend money to do them. And the more I learned, the more I realized I could probably sell these services outside of the studio. Started doing stuff for local artists, local businesses, things like that. And the more I kept building websites, the more I realized I actually enjoy this process just as much as I enjoy music. Um, so I kept doing more, kept learning more, started networking with the local um, development scene, meeting other people. And that eventually led me to applying for a few jobs and got a lot of calls immediately. So yeah, all, all just happened just because I was curious more than me actually trying to, to do anything. And, and, and you know, that's it. <laughs> well, it led to a career though, bro. Like it, it yeah. I mean, it led, it took a minute and it's not like you're necessarily looking for it, but it, it led to your whole career. Yeah, and and I, I feel like there's certain things that happen for a reason. I feel like that that was one of the things because I like I enjoy my job, and I also enjoy the fact that for so long I was full time doing music. Um, so it became work to me as opposed to that thing that I do for fun. So it's good to be able to have something that pays the bills and that I enjoy. And then now music can go back to being that fun thing that I do and still, you know, get pleasure from, and it's like a, a break away from work as opposed to being what I have to wake up and think about every day. Mm -hmm. And you, you're doing, doing a little bit of music for, for pleasure at the moment, right? Yes, I'm in the beginning stages of starting a label have a couple of artists that we're working with, um, you know, nothing notable to talk about right now, hopefully in a year. Well, had it not been for the past year, I should have had something to talk about by this point, but everything, you know, everything kind of got slowed down and we didn't get to execute the vision the way we wanted it. So hopefully in the coming year, we'll have a little bit more to, to, to speak about. Maybe my next appearance, we can we can talk about that stuff. Yeah, it has to be your next after next appearance because we're doing the daggone retrospective joint on the on the music. 
And oh, I, I really want to do that now because uh, I think it would be fun. I think it would be, and who knows what it would mean to anybody else, but I think it would be fun to do just to look back because I don't think I've ever like thought deeply about everything. And uh, yeah, I think that would be fun. I think that would be fun. Yeah, definitely. All right, so we'll get that done. I don't even know what kind of time frame we're working on now. We had the technical difficulties that Joey had us <laughs> sent us for a loop. Oh yeah. I know you get you have uh, two children. Yes. Two kids, uh, a boy and a girl, and uh, <laughs> I mean your kids are, are you know well you have one teen. One teen, one almost yeah. Well, getting close to teen, yeah. And then Maybe nine in next year, so yeah. Yeah, so how has that process been? Because, you know, not everybody's built to be a parent. Not everybody loves it. You know, I love it. I think everybody knows I love being a parent. So how has that been for you? It's been great. Um, love my kids. Um, love being able to pass on the wisdom that my parents passed on to me and my sisters. I mean, they're like, like almost like my second and third mom. And... Yeah, love it to death. Love seeing their achievements. Love helping them through their struggles. Um, yeah, the, the the whole thing. Son is heavy into sports, which thank goodness he's getting back to. Daughter could be potentially following in my footsteps and going into development, but more on the dev side as opposed to the design side. And she's doing her thing, so I can't wait to see what the future holds. Did, did you have to, did you push her into, uh, not push her, but <laughs> you kind of introduce her to the uh, tech savvy side of the world, like code and stuff like that? Or Here's the thing. She and she's, she's in the other room, so I'm pretty sure that she's going to hear this. But forever, there's been different things that I enjoy that I always say like, hey, you might like this thing. And she's always said no. It started off with basketball when she was younger. You could recognize that for her age, she was tall. So it's like, hey, you might want to play basketball. So I remember she was about eight years old. And I said, here, we're going to get a basketball hoop. I'm going to teach you how to play basketball. She decided quickly, I don't want to do this. She goes to middle school. First, first, I think first or second week of middle school, she comes home. Hey, I decided to try out for the girls' basketball team, like just out of nowhere. You know, so she has a history of those sort of things. So I introduced her to coding early on. She didn't want to do it at the time. Then I told her about um, um, a friend of mine started a girls who code chapter here um, locally. So I got her into that and she kind of did it, but she, you know, did it, but she didn't really didn't take to it. Then when the opportunity for high schools came up and one of her picks was code RVA. So She's now attending Code RVA. She's learning Python right now and actually doing very, very well. She'll come home and talk to me about stuff that's completely over my head. Or she'll show me a project that she put together. And I'm like, geez, this is amazing because I get paid for this and I couldn't do what you just did. Um, so it's one of those things where, yeah, I introduced her to her, introduced her to her, but no, nah, she took that and ran with it all on her own. It's all her. That's dope. That's dope. I wish. I wish I had, or even, not to I mean, you know, my kids are doing what they're doing and they love what, what they're planning on doing in, in their lives. But I wish that would have been a path or had been recognized as a path, I guess, more uh, a few years beforehand. Cause I feel like, I mean, clearly it's, it's the way, <laughs> it's the way we're going. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's so many opportunities in that uh, realm, especially for, Black girls to be able to get into it early, I think that's that's dope. Yeah, and um, uh, I can't think of the name of. Oh, this is killing me. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's always good just to see, you know, young girls, people of color, get into STEM. Um, just because there's such a lack of like I know from going to like different conferences different like meet and greets, there's very few people who look like me in those rooms and those spaces. So just any anything to give any kind of, it doesn't have to be a push, just an introduction because you never know, you know, because I can say that she did this all on her own, but who knows if just me introducing it to her 
at an early age might have influenced the this is okay to do sort of thing in her mind or you know the fact that I, she did play basketball might have been why she decided to go ahead and try out for the team you know just anything that you wear somebody could get a taste of what it's like with you know because you would always you can always make up different things in your head to say I, oh I can't do this or oh this isn't for me and just to be able to experience it in any kind of level is is very very beneficial indeed indeed Oh man, so I think we've done enough, man. I think I've taken enough of your your Sunday afternoon. What anything that we need to inform the people about? I know you said eventually you'll have some thoughts on on the music tip, but uh, anything else you want you want to drop? Uh, not that I can think of. I don't have anything to plug. Um, <laughs> that's rare. That is very rare on. <laughs> Yeah, I'm low key, you know, go to work, take care of the kids, um, you know, try to save some money. That's about it for me. Right, I can respect it. I can respect it. Once again, oh, and let me at least mention Wordsworth. I had words on uh, two episodes ago. He was episode 50. And we Shout talked about words, man. Huh? Shout out to words. Yeah. And then, I, yeah, that was. It was crazy to hear the story from his view about trust and it made hearing him say it made a lot more sense because we've talking you know over the years about that song and i had never heard that story told that way before until your podcast it was like wow okay that, that yeah. made sense. so for those for those who don't know well you can go back and look at uh, episode 50 check that out but basically, Words was explaining how his career uh, trajectory changed with the, uh, the song that, that you all did and subsequent video, which, plug, hey, we're in the joint. Obviously, he's going to be in it. I was there too. It was a good time. We had a ball. What? The video you can see you easier in the video than you can see me. So. I've, I've always thought that every time we get to that scene, I always tell people where you are in the video first because I'm in the shadow. So yeah, I'm there and I'm closer to him, but you're more visible than I am in that scene. The funny part is people have that I've never talked to about that video have been like, yo, what are you doing in the world for a video? Because <laughs> you, because you sitting, you were sitting up on the, the that it wasn't a, like a banister, but it was like like brick and con like it was brick and stone stairs. So yeah. you're sitting up, but I'm sitting down on the stairs while words are standing up. So I'm right next to him, but you can see you way easier. <laughs> it was a fun day. I, we talked about it not too long ago, uh, even outside of the video shooting and us driving up from from Richmond to New York, New Jersey. Yeah, because we missed the the gotta pay filming. Yeah. Because that was when we was actually driving up. Mm, but we did get a chance to have some some great breakfast biscuits. I don't know where we were. We were in New Jersey. Don't know what mm -hmm. day, what town. But this joint had the the greatest breakfast sandwiches, and it was a little deli. Had the greatest breakfast sandwiches like ever. So, uh, yeah. That's yeah, it. I have no idea where we were. It was just across the water, wherever yeah. we were. But yeah, oh my god, yeah. Good times, good times. Well, we have a lot more to talk about. But we'll save that for this uh, look back at the music that we're going to do. And we're really going to do this. So I know we can't. Yeah, we're do it. So we're going to get this done. Uh, once again, this is Todd Easter, a.k.a. Docs One. Source. Up to you.